So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's tutorial. Today, we are going to look at muscles of facial expression, muscles that produce various expressions of the face, so that you can help in nonverbal communication. Now, these muscles, embryologically, arise from the second, you know, pharyngeal arch or the second, you know, brinkal arch. And that's the mesoderm, mesodermal portion. And these muscles, therefore, will be innervated by nerve to the second brinkal arch. That's the facial nerve, cranial nerve sub. Now, for descriptive purposes, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to divide these muscles into three main groups. I'm going to talk about the okra eyes, muscles that work around the eye, muscles that work around the nose, the nasal bit, and we look at those which work around the, I mean, mouth, the oral, I mean, part. Well, I also look at, you know, the auricular muscles as well. So, without much ado, yes, let's begin our journey with muscles. I mean, all muscles of, you know, facial expression. So, here we are. And for these muscles, we are going to start with the ocular muscles first. The muscles which are going to work on the eye. Now, the or the orbital, you know, muscles actually. Now, these orbital group, yes, or ocular group, are going to be associated with the eye, as we said, controlling various actual movements. Now, importantly, is this muscle which encircles, gives the circular profile. This muscle is known as obicularis oculi muscle. Obicularis oculi muscle. Now, this muscle actually arises from the medial margin, okay, medial margin of what we call the, I mean, orbital, medial orbital margin, actually, and the, as well as the medial papillary ligament, and of course, the lacrimal bone, for we know the lacrimal bone be medial over here. And it will come all the way to insert around, you know, the skin, laterally, around the lateral aspect of the skin, you know, laterally. So that is what we are going to find, okay? Now, this muscle is going to have three parts. We have the parts which surround the papillary or the eyelids, which we call the papillary part. We have the part which surrounds the, I mean, ocular socket or the eye, I mean, cavity, the orbit, and we call it the orbital part. We have the part which is related to the lacrimal bones, okay? And therefore, we call this one the lacrimal part. So it's going to have three parts. And therefore, the actions are also going to be different. The papillary part, when one sleeps, you know, closes the eyes gently, closes the eye gently. So that's what it does. And then for the lacrimal part, it is responsible for drainage of tears. Okay, so that tears can actually spread across, you know, the eyeball for drainage of, you know, tears. Now the orbital part, okay, where is the largest part? is going to be useful for tightly closing the eye. So if you want to actually tightly close your eye, okay, it's by the kind of of the orbital part, which is going to do that. All right, now, as we said, these nerves are going to be innervated by the cranial nerve seven, that's the facial nerve. So what happens is that if there's damage to this cranial nerve seven, which is the facial nerve, there will be inability for one to actually shut, you know, the eye. When that happens, the cornea of the eye, uh, that's the, I mean, anterior one cyst of, you know, the, you know, the outer tunic of the eye. The cornea will go through, you know, dryness, will be, go through dryness. And, you know, in a condition that we call it, you know, exposure keratitis, you know, there will be that kind of condition. Now, the lower eyelid, if that one happens, lower eyelid, yes, will actually also droop. Okay, we'll be weak. We can't close it, so we'll be weak. Therefore, we'll droop in a condition, you know, where there will be actually accumulation of, you know, tears, okay, around that area. You know, you can't actually drain it, okay? So that's what is going to happen. And if that happens, then if there are any particulate matter in the tears, which is supposed to be drained, they will still be there. And they will cause what you call lacerations on the surface of the cornea. So that is one thing that will actually happen. So mainly, that is what we are going to see. Therefore, 
in the hospital if you want to test for the facial nerve one thing that we do is while the patient try to raise the eyebrow or to close the eyelids so that's one thing that we're going to do all right so that is the obicularis so obicularis oculi obicular meaning having the circular profile oculi surrounding the eye bone now the next muscle that we find okay is what we call the corrugator the corrugator is actually deep to you know this area of the obicularis oris oculi we call it corrugator supercilii corrugator supercilii now this corrugator supercilii you know is going to originate from the supracerali arch supracerali arch and it will run you know superlaterally to actually insert on the skin of the eyebrow so that is one thing that we are going to find which we call the corrugator supercilii now this corrugator supercilii will be relevant in bringing the eyebrow closer together so on either side we have it through upon contraction of the corrugator supercilii it will bring the eyebrows you know closer to i mean each other and what it does is that after doing this it's able to treat some kind of vertical wrinkles just above the bridge of the nose so there's the bridge of the nose so just above it upon contraction will create some vertical you know um, uh, wrinkles you know just above the bridges of the nose okay so that's what corrugator supercilii is going to do so these represent the muscles which are going to work around the orbital area or the ocular area now the next muscle group of muscle uh, represent what we call the nasal group of muscles now for the nasal group of muscles they will be involved in some movement of the nose you know as well as the skin that around that's around the area and notably we are going to find what we call the nasalis muscle okay this is a nasalis muscle okay so we have the nasalis muscle now the nasalis muscle is going to have two parts it's going to have you know this transverse part and it's also going to have what we call the ala parts you know there's the wing of the nose so the ala parts as well as the uh, transverse part now what happens is that it's going to actually originate actually from the muscle the maxillary bone okay that's where they are going to originate from the maxillary bone actually and then it will i mean they will insert okay so usually the transverse one will insert across the dorsal part of the nose okay the dorsal part of the nose the dorsum of the nose okay and then the other part will actually insert on the ala cartilage so there are some cartilages over here what you call them ala cartilages so that's what we are going to find now surprisingly although these muscles are the same the transverse and of course the other parts they are both nasalis muscles but they work antagonistically so with the transverse parts you know working to compress okay the external nerves so that the external nerves become close the other part works to actually open it make the external nerves actually patent okay so that's what we are going to open actually the nostrils okay so the transverse part is working to close it then the i mean other part is working to actually open it so that's one thing that we're going to find now the next muscle that we find over here okay also works on the nose it's around the nose nasal area and this muscle okay is known as procerus procerus so that is the procerus muscle now this procerus muscle is the most i mean superior nasal muscle yeah, actually and it's going to originate from actually the nasal bone okay so there are two nasal bones where it is going to originate from and it will insert on the lower medial portion of the forehead lower medial portion of the forehead okay so around the forehead area lower portion that's where it's going to actually insert so that is the procerus muscle procerus muscle now this procerus muscle as you know you know is going what it's going to do is to actually contract and pull you know actually the skin over the you know eyebrow down so it produces that, that kind of you know vertical um, it's going to produce that kind of you know vertical actually sorry it's going to produce some kind of you know transverse transverse um, uh, what do you call wrinkles remember that the corrugator uh, supercilii is going to produce what we call vertical wrinkles and this one produce transverse wrinkles procerus muscle now the next 
group of muscle, which, no, the next muscle, which is part of this group of nasal muscles, is known as depressor, depressor septi nasi. So its name, so from the nasal septum, so it's going to depress, you know, the nasal septum. So it works, you know, alongside, you know, it's going to have some kind of synergistic, you know, effects to that we find with the, you know, the, uh, the other part, okay, the other part of what we call the nasalis muscle. So what it's, what it's going to do is to make actually the nostrils patent, but in so doing, it also depresses the septal cartilage. So that's the name depressor, you know, septi nasi, depressor septi nasi. It is going to have some synergistic effect with the other component of the nasalis muscle by way of, you know, trying to make the external nares patent open so that air, more air can actually enter. So these represent the muscles of which are work around, you know, the nasal area. Now the next group of muscles that we want to also learn will be the oral group, will be the oral group. Now for the oral group, yes, we are going to find these main muscles. There are two main muscles. Then we will also look at other muscles as well. Now these two main muscles, one of them also has this circular profile as it moves around the lip. And we call this muscle orbicularis oris muscle. Orbicularis oris muscle. So this orbicularis oris muscle is also having this you know, circular round profile. That's why we are calling it to be clarus and oris around the lip. So this is the muscle. Now this muscle, obiclarus oris muscle, which actually originates from the maxilla, okay, from maxillary bone, okay. You know, and it is going to actually, yes, as well as you know, the, some of the cheek muscles, okay, or some of the cheek muscles around here, mainly you're going to be the vaccinator muscle, okay, and then it will actually insert on the skin as well as the mucos, mucosa or mucous membrane around the lips the skin and mucous membrane around the lips so that's what it's going to do we're going to originate from maxilla okay as well as some cheekbones inserts around the skin okay as well as the mucous membrane of the lips now this muscle what it does is that it pierces the lips uh, what do i mean it closes protrudes and actually compresses the lips you know when you want to actually close your lip you know quite tightly this is the muscle, orbicularis oris muscle. Okay, orbicularis oris muscle. So that is one thing that we're going to find. Now the next muscle, which you find it here, and this muscle, yes, as you see it here, in the living is pierced by this duct, which is a stencil duct, the parotid duct of the parotid gland. Okay, so this muscle is known as the vaccinator muscle. Because related to the cheek, and cheek is the buccal area, so vaccinator muscle. So this muscle is very important when you actually use, you know, uh, for instance, the trumpet, you blow air in it. The muscle which is very important, you know, is actually this vaccinator muscle. Now this vaccinator muscle, therefore, will be, I mean, between what you call the maxilla and of course the mandible. As you can see, there's the mandible. The maxilla is here, it's between them. And therefore, we say that this vaccinator muscle originates from the mandible as well as the muscle, okay? And then the fibers actually move, you know, inferomedially. They move actually inferomedially, okay, in an inferior manner, but moving medially. And actually, we insert by blending with what we call the muscle of the obicularis oris muscle, you know, around the skin of the lips. So that's where, you know, it's going to actually insert. So that's what we find. And the action, you know, it pulls actually the cheek in walls against the teeth. Okay, so that during, I mean, feeding, what happens is that the, I mean, cheeks, which will contain some salivary glands, which will secrete saliva, will be pulled closer, you know, to the, I mean, so that the content in the mouth, the food, will have access to the saliva. Okay, now one thing is that if you talk about these minor salivary glands, you know, the big car glands are minor salivary glands. They will be found in the submucosa, okay, you know, of, you know, the, the cheek, the lips, and what have you. So that's one thing that we are going to find. Now, in so doing, the vaccinator muscle will be relevant in preventing food from accumulating in between the teeth, you know, and the cheeks. So they are actually helping not food not accumulating in there. 
So that's one thing that we find with the vaccinator muscle. Now the next muscle, group of muscles, which are also part of this, you know, oral group of muscles, we are going to find what we call the superior group, and we also find what we call the inferior group. Now for the superior group, we have what we call one of them being depressor angli oris, depressor angli oris. Now these represent the angles of the lips, which we call them labial commissure or angular stoma. And so these are the labial commissures or the angular stoma. And that's why, you know, when they get inflamed, we call it, you know, angular stomatitis or chelitis. So that is one thing, you know, typical, you know, of, you know, something like iron deficiency anemia, people have these kind of chelitis or angular stomatitis. These are the labial uh, commissures or the oral commissures. Now what we find is that there are some muscles which are actually above this area and therefore they form the superior group and we have those ones which are below and we form the what we call the inferior group. Now for the upper group, one of them is the depressor angli oris. So depressor is going to actually depress, you know, this muscle, sorry, uh, we are talking about the superior group first, so we are going to look at what we call the rhizomes. Now there's this muscle over here which we call it, sorry, this muscle, okay, which will have, okay, insertion over here. Now, this muscle that we find over here is known as rhizorius, rhizorius. So, that's what we find, okay, rhizorius, and then you come to this one, okay. So, as I move from the rhizorius, as I move superiorly, this muscle is known as zygomatis, zygomaticus major muscle. Because you can see the zygomatic bone, zygomaticus major muscle. Now, let me tell you about the function of the rhizorius. Now, what the rhizorius, you know, does is that it draws back the angle of the mouth, so it pulls it, you know, laterally and posteriorly. Okay. So one thing is that depend on how the muscle inserts, you're able to tell its action. So look at how it inserts. It's inserted, so therefore, it's able to draw the lip. Okay. I mean. The corners of the I mean lip actually laterally and posteriorly. So that's what the rhizorius does. And this muscle, which is the zygomaticus major muscle, and then superior to it, we have zygomaticus minor muscle. They will work you know in synergy. So that what will happen is that the zygomaticus major will pull the angle of the mouth superior laterally. So you can see how it's inserted, so superior laterally, to so pull it superiorly but laterally. And then of course, you know, zygomaticus minor will also draw the lip, you know backward you know upward and outward having some kind of synergistic effect to that we find for the zygomaticus major now one thing is that for the zygomaticus major sometimes it becomes bifid you know especially people with you know dimples the fibers actually divide into two so that's when upon smiling or when speaking there will be that kind of dimple created in there and because of defects it's unable to actually get fused correctly that is like much cause major muscle. Now, the next muscle which we are going to look at is the, I mean, the, um, let's talk about actually the, the superior, the levator, you know, labi superioris muscle, the levator labi superioris muscle. Now, the name is levator, okay, labi superioris. So, this muscle, there is this muscle over here, okay which actually comes this way so it's actually going to elevate so we call it levator okay lip yeah it has to do with the lip superioris it helps actually pull the lip upwards okay so levator by superioris elevates actually the upper lip now the next muscle which you also find here okay deep to the levator by superioris muscle is you know what we call levator you know uh, Labi angularis, okay. So this muscle, which is the levator, you know, angli oris actually, levator angli oris. So this muscle, levator. So it's coming to the angle of the lip. So it's going to elevate, yes, and draw back, you know, the angle of the lip actually. So levator, you know, angli oris. You know, elevate the angle of the mouth, you know, medial, actually, medial. So, this is that muscle. Now, one thing that we get to know is that most of these muscles are going to insert over here. Okay. 
going to insert over here an apple not trick you know structure over here which we call it you know the modulus the modulus this is where most of these muscles are going to insert okay so that's one thing now the next you know actually muscle that we're going to see which forms part of the superior group is having a very long name which we call levator labi spiralis alaki nisi surprisingly that's the name levator now this muscle this muscle which you can see the fibers here okay that's the levator the name is levator labi spiralis alaki nisi so it has to do something to do with the nasal, the, the nose. It has also to do something with the, I mean, the lip, and it is superiorly, you know, oriented. So this is that muscle, and this muscle, what it does is that it dilates the nostrils, so that it becomes more patent for air to actually go through. Apart from that, it's also very important in elevating the upper lip, in elevating the upper lip. So that is what we are going to find. These are the muscles which are going to work. You know, superior mostly going to draw the lip upwards, you know, either the corners of the lip or mainly the lip, you know, upwards or superior. Now, we have those ones too, which are going to work on the lip, you know, downwards, either the substance of the lip or the corners of the lip downwards. Now, these muscles are going to include what we call the depressor angli oris. So, look at this. Now, this is the angle. So, if you have a muscle who is going to depress, you know, the angle. Let me just use this. Okay, so this muscle, sorry, depressor angli oris, depressor angli oris. So this is the muscle, depressor angli oris. So as the name suggests, depressor angli, you know, oris. I mean, it will be important in pulling the mouth inferior laterally. It will move. Look at how the fibers are moving. They move inferiorly and laterally. So inferior laterally. Now the next muscle that we are going to find will be the depressor labi inferioris. You know, depressor, you know, labi inferioris. Um, sorry, depressor labi. I mean, inferioris. Yes, we've seen this. Now the next one that we want to see is what you call you now depressor angli oris. Depressor angli oris. Now this is the angle. You know, can you see this muscle coming out. This is depressor angli oris depressor angli oris so as the name suggests look at how the fibers are even running so the depressor you know angli oris will be important actually in you know pulling the mouth you know or the lower lip actually inferolaterally you know inferolaterally okay so that the depressor angli oris so inferiorly okay that's how it's going to work on it so that is, I mean, one thing that we, we are going to see. So these ones, working on it inferolaterally, this one also working inferolaterally. So that's one thing, pulling the angle of the lip, actually inferolaterally. So that's what we see. Now, the next muscle that we are going to find will be the mentalis muscle. Okay, this muscle that we find here will be actually the mentalis muscle. Okay, mentalis muscle. Now, what this mentalis does is that it elevates and wrinkles the skin around the chin. Okay, elevates and wrinkles the chin. The, I mean, the skin around the chin. That's what we find for the mentalis, you know, muscle. Now, these muscles, yes, let me just end with this. That, which, I mean, when we get to, you know, actually when we look at the scalp, okay, we look at the layers of the scalp. You get to understand certain things, but for now, you see that there's this muscle over here, which also produces some facial expression. That's the frontal belly of the occipital frontalis muscle. So there's a frontal belly. You also have what we call the occipital belly, okay, around the occiput, and they will be connected by the gallia aponeurotica or the, I mean, aponeurosis, you know, of the scalp. Now we look at those ones, but these ones are also able to produce some kind of facial expression. For instance. The frontal belly of the osteo frontalis actually it helps in elevation of the, I mean, eye, you know, brow, elevation of the eyebrow. So that's what we, we find actually. Now, finally, what happens is that although in humans, the muscles which are going to work around, you know, the ear, you know, it's sort of, you know, vestigial by way of function, 
because for lower animals like goats and what have you, they're able to actually contract these muscles to actually regulate, okay, or change the positions of the ear to help in actually concentrating, you know, sound, okay, into the ear. But these muscles, notably, we are going to call them the auricularis, you know, muscles or the auricular muscles. So we have what we call the superior auricular muscle, okay, we have what we call the anterior auricular muscle, and then of course, we also have what we call posterior auricular muscle. So these muscles, yes, as I said, they will actually be, I mean, vestigial in humans, unless, you know, some people, there's the posterior auricular, superior auricular, and of course, we're going to have what we call the, I mean, uh, anterior auricular muscles. These muscles are going to help in actually, in lower animals, to actually change the shape of the eye externally to actually help in localization of sound. All right, I hope it's going to be helpful to you when you want to study muscles of the facial expression. We look at the various, you know, muscles, you know, and then you get a complete picture at the end of the day. Thank you very much for your audience and may God richly bless you.